exceptions to that? I'm thinking about putting it on YouTube. Well, thank you very much. And actually, my talk will be about one of the weird masses, which are typical of mathematics. Uh, this is going to shake sometimes because I have Parkinson's disease, and so I have to walk seated and try to control my right arm. Okay, hope this won't be. That's the main question is, I have already uh, heard this conjecture several times. Does the uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics is correspond somehow is a kind of transform, a matter of transform of undecidability and incompleteness in formal systems? More detail. Do we need quantum mechanics to have something like undecidability and feudal incompleteness in physics? Are quantum effects some kind of physical counterpart to undecidability and incompleteness in logic? Then, is classical physics complete? The answer is no. They are very different phenomena, and in particular, Undecidability and incompleteness is a kind of linguistic phenomenon which you can find in several sufficiently complex theories of mathematics. We discussed it, Doug Costa, Newton Acosta, who is an expert in logic in my country, and myself, we discussed these questions about 25 years ago in a paper which is called Classical Physics and Penrose's Thesis. I picked up somewhat arbitrarily a quotation from that book where he defines, it's here, Thesis 1, Penrose's Thesis, where he gives a few ideas that seem to relate undecidability and incompleteness to quantum mechanics and we try to give a counterexample. I would say I, I was very cautious was a final right of the paper and we did, had a long discussion about this. We try to offer it as a kind of tentative or possible counterexample to Penrose's uh, ideas in this so-called thesis one. As the path to the discussion we held in that paper is a long one, I decided to make something which usually makes people more comfortable. That is, I decided to go very smoothly along the path and give a few elementary ideas up to the point where we can really discuss uh, the issue. The prehistory of undecidability and incompleteness is assuredly given by the work of Georg Cato and Bertrand Russell. Said theory was the value 1870s by Georg Cato and was plagued by paradox. One well-known paradox is this one, is the paradox of a set of all sets. It leads to a contradiction, a very simple contradiction because you have one set which shouldn't, should, must, uh, has to contain all other sets, including a set which cannot fit inside, which is a set of all its parts. This is due to Cantor, this is the guy. 
And then we have the well-known Russell's paradox, which I formulated also in the well-known form of the barber who shapes the man in the village. And uh, I think it's a very nice presentation of what really goes wrong there. In the village, the men are divided into two sets. Either they are shaped by the local barber or they shape themselves. To which set does a local barber fit? It's a contradiction. Here is Burton Russell. Set theory in its naive form led to contradictions, but it was such a beautiful construct that it was a pity to throw it away. What could we, how could we somehow fix the theory? The idea was to formulate it according to some more precise and more formalized axioms. The solution was developed by Zermelo, Abraham Franklin, and other people in the first three decades of the 20th century. But are those axioms consistent? Yes. So we try to solve the problem, but we got a bigger one. And the bigger one was formulated by David Hiller. Before we get that, I would like to show this picture. This is a, a painting by Jackson Pollock. My wife, who is a doctor, a pediatrician, but who helps me in the aesthetics of my presentation, told me, you are going to be very abstract, so we must show that art also has. <laughs> so you rest a bit to see a beautiful painting that is in Venice, I believe, in the, the Guggenheim collection. And <laughs> okay, you get the point. Let's talk about Hilbert's program, which was uh, uh, he was trying to fix the issues in set theory. The main goal of Hilbert's program was to provide secure foundation for all mathematics. It was shown to be impossible, but let's split it out. A formalization of all mathematics we, we already had at that point. Axiomatic set theory. Completeness. A proof that truth in mathematics is the same as probability. And that should happen to all main mathematical theories should be available. Consistency, a proof that there is no contradiction within mathematics. Conservation, which, isn't, which isn't usually discussed. Conservation is the following. I prove a theorem about finite stuff, but I require, say, very large cardinal numbers to prove that. Hilbert claimed that proof Proofs dealing with finite objects and leading to finite objects had to be able to be performed without any appeal to infinite idealized objects in mathematics. That's wrong. Let me do. I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about it. Decidability, an algorithm that settles all, that decides, for instance, whether some statement, some formal sentence, is or isn't a theorem in our theory. Again, we don't have it. Formalization of mathematics had already been reached with its analytic Franklin set theory. And to, as of today, we already have a program that we will be able to list all theorems of mathematics, as you may understand. <laughs> This is going to be something very cumbersome, but sometimes you can, uh, you can at least use it in your formulation, uh, say, if you require that kind of object in any theorem. Uh, but is this thing consistent? Is it complete? No. The great example was given by Kurt Gödel in 1931. I'm going to uh, discuss with a bit more uh, detail two proofs 
altogether incomplete in this theorems, which are in the original proof by Gyurgyi. Consistency has the following property. If, roughly, if the theory includes piano arithmetic, actually you don't require that much of arithmetic, you require a weaker theory, then it cannot prove its own, own consistency. That result follows from Gödel's second completest theorem. And you can give an example which was given by Gödel in 1931 uh, of a sentence in arithmetic which is true in the standard model for mathematical arithmetic, but which you cannot prove if the theory is consistent and sound. Sound means when I talk about numbers, I'm talking about numbers. So there is a standard interpretation of the theory. Conservation. This is the most interesting goal. This is quite tricky, but there are already, it was some 20 years ago, I believe, that Thomas Yetch uh, obtained an example of a theorem about growing sequences whose uh, proof necessarily depends on a, a very large transfinite cardinal, an inaccessible cardinal. You cannot give this proof without uh, this cardinal. There are now several examples. Harry Friedman has been doing lots of research in that direction. And I won't elaborate too much on this point because it becomes very technical. But the idea is being finite doesn't really mean in mathematics that you can reach, you can understand, you can prove the theorem uh, without using infinite objects. Sometimes you do require that. That's why I said mathematics is really very, very new. The side ability, both piano arithmetic and set theory, axiomatic set theory, are undecidable theories, again from Gödel's theorem. Here is Hilbert, very elegant with his head. Well, as we have seen, the main obstacle to the fulfillment of Hilbert's program were the two incompleteness theorems by Gödel, published in 1931. We are going to sketch two different proofs of the first of those theorems. These proofs show the deep interconnection between computability and probability. Computers are limited by the halting problem and other impossibility results. Formal systems are limited by Gödel's theorems. And when you formulate uh, the halting problem with an axiomatic set theory, you see that both are equivalent on this side of the that, that is the non-existence of uh, an algorithm, a general algorithm to decide whether a sentence is a theorem or not, and incompleteness. Uh, formal systems are limited by Gödel's theorem. We carry the limits of computation to the limits of probability in formal systems. I'm going to be very fast here because there are a few technical details, but everything is elementary, and I'm leaving this set of notes to anyone who is interested. Uh, the program to prove these versions of the incompleteness, the first incompleteness theorem, requires uh, that we have a concept of computation. We implement, make them concrete, so to say, with the help of Turing machines. We discuss a halting problem. We discuss formal systems, Gödel incompleteness out of the halting problem, but also, yes? Uh, do you believe that Turing machine give an absolute model of computation? No. Or as many believe now there are 
super recursive algorithms that are more powerful than Turing machines. Yes, actually I was a, the co-editor of a special issue of uh, one mathematical journal on hypercomputation and have already published ten one dozen papers on hypercomputation. I use in my case and you are going to see at the very end of this road, uh, I use analog computers coupled to Turing machine as articles. Okay, let, let me go back to this. Uh, but my answer is no, I don't think, don't believe this is uh, the fix that I, the perfect, the correct view of computation. It's a conventional, a very useful view, which is sort of uh, underlies uh, all our theory of computation, but I believe there are other possibilities. The halting problem form of system given completeness out of the halting problem, which is a very simple argument which was given by Emil Post in 1943, I believe. Good incompleteness out of total recursive functions. Georg Heisel used it. It's due to a 1936 paper by Stephen Kleen and is very beautiful and very simple. And there is Chaitin's incompleteness theorem, which I like very much. I'm partial because Greg Chaitin is a very good friend. I like him a lot, and so I like his mathematical work. The concept of computation. I'm going to sketch it and I'm going to jump over the details of Turing machines. The uh, computation, the input set of data that are our starting points, a finite binary, binary string. The set of instructions is also given in a finite string of zeros and ones. The computation proceeds in stepwise manner. The output is given by a finite string, but there may be no output. The operation of the machine may go forever. The process of computation requires a finite, even if arbitrarily large, memory. And the whole procedure is deterministic. We, the simplest, at least the most intuitive implementation of these concepts, is given by Turing machines. It's described here, and here's a picture of the, the beast, and that's it. A Turing machine operates as follows. The head is placed, okay, it's just a uh, thing. And here is Alan Turing when he was 16. Again, my wife interfered, Kandinsky. <laughs> it's full of circles and triangles and the like, it's mathematical, and also it's very abstract. Uh, I would say she has a very peculiar sense of humor. <laughs> the halting problem. The computation may either stop or go on indefinitely. For example, when you divide 10 by 3. Can we predict when a complicated computation will go on forever without stopping? No, not in the general case. The argument I give here to prove the halting problem is one of the simplest I could find in the literature. Turing's <coughs> argument in his 1936 paper is, is awful. It's awful, you end up by understanding it, but it's uh, very complicated. This one is the improvement of the last several of the things that I merged in this argument. You're, essentially, you have to have a list of all possible programs, computer programs. Let's talk about computer programs. I have a listing of a program that lists all computer programs. And out of that, I suppose that there is one program which would be the halting pro program and see that it leads to a contradiction. If G is a program, here is the I. So the program like G cannot exist. Formal systems. This definition here was given by a friend. The formal system is a bit 
like a game of Lego. Because you have elements, bricks to build the objects you require in a rearranged way according to certain rules. So this is the Lego de depiction of a well-formed formula, which is uh, an expression, roughly, in the formal <coughs> language of the theory we are constructing. Formal systems I use in my work are basically piano arithmetic, which is the standard stuff. The formal system also should have some basic proof to start from the axioms of the theory. And here is the argument that Post gave in his, I think it's, it, it's a long review paper, but which concludes with uh, this, this proof uh, of, of Gödel's first incompleteness theorem. It supposes one can formalize concepts like to machines and the like within the theory and gets everything out of that. The sentence which he shows to be undecidable, which has no proof nor disproof, is Turing machine and K over input M diverges for a specific K and M. <coughs> and the argument is, you put, if you su suppose that there is, you can prove one such sentence, then you violate the Hopping problem, because you could, uh, since there is an equivalence, a correspondence, sorry, between, uh, uh, there is a correspondence between proof and computation, and you would then, by incorporating the tools you have, from the formal system into the possible computation you are able to do, to get the contradiction because it violates the non-existence of the halting function. Here's Gödel. Gödel laughing, laughing at us. <laughs> it's a weird kind of <laughs> sense of humor. Okay. There is also a very beautiful, I mentioned, incompleteness theorem by uh, Stephen Holtrin, which deals with functions which you can have, you can prove to be total within uh, your own your formal theory. And this leads eventually, you prove that there is a function which is intuitively total by a diagonal procedure. You reach a function which is intuitively naively total, but which you cannot prove to be total with the theory. This was much used by Georg Heisen in some big papers published in 1951, 53. And it was Kaiser himself. We, we had some correspondence with him in the late 90s uh, discussing issues in the theory of complexity, uh, on computational complexity. And he emphasized all the time the importance of this argument by Klee. Okay. Here's a proof, the proof is very simple. And here's a guy. It's sometime. Finally, there is an incompleteness theorem by Greg Scheidman, which is formulated here in italics. The information content of string k is larger than k. k for a given value of this integer, k0, the sentence is cannot be proved in arithmetic or within your theory. Now I appear in the picture because Greg tried it all. Luckily, he, he is still uh, alive. He's a very good friend. And you meet here on the other side, Newton da Costa, the logician with whom I have worked. And, okay, this is the non-trivial part of my talk. I'm just going to show you. This is a halting function. Because you cannot explicitly write a program. You cannot, not even implicitly. You cannot write a program 
that uh, settles the halting problem. But you can write it as a function in the language of analysis. You can write explicitly. Hidden here in this C is a transform of a universal Diophantine equation. So you have really lots of mathematics embedded into this expression. Da Costa and I obtained this expression in 1990, I think so, nearly 30 years ago. We were trying to do something totally unrelated to these issues here. The problem was, do we have an algorithm to test for chaos, for chaotic systems in the identical systems theory? And the answer is no. Doesn't matter if you come up with a new definition for chaos. For any definition you can concoct, you won't be able to find uh, an algorithm or uh, some kind of mechanical procedure to distinguish between uh, chaotic and non-chaotic systems, systems that will exhibit eventually a chaotic behavior and systems which don't have this kind of behavior. It was published in 1999 and 1991. And, well, okay, uh, Jan Stewart liked it very much. He wrote uh, a piece on it for nature. But somehow it went down, uh, down the same. Uh, this, let me stress the point. I, I said that I don't believe in I don't believe that the, the Turing model is, uh, uh, say, an, the kind of absolute model for computers, for computation, for the idea of computation. Because I believe we can somehow build an, an analog computer which coupled as a model of the Turing machine will be able to settle uns, uh, unsolvable uh, we'll be able to go beyond the Turing barrier, which is the, the, the limits imposed by the unsolvability with respect to computer programs of the Halby problem. And here is one of the tricks we used. Form theta is the halting function. <coughs> form this expression z, z equals x and z equals x prime are both undecidable sentences. It's trivial like that once you have the halting function. Uh, this leads to another surprise. Actually, who pointed out to us that we have this result implicit in our work was Pat Soupis. Pat Soupis came to me, I, I, I was at, at Stanford at the, that time, and Pat was a kind of friendly referee for my papers before I submitted them to publication. And he kept, uh, shouted from his table deep in his office that you know you have something very general in here which was, we spoke, a kind of generalization for the for most of everyday mathematics of Rice's theorem in computer science. The predicate P is trivial if everything satisfies P or nothing satisfies P. If P is a non-trivial predicate, then there is no algorithm to decide in the general case, the general case is all very important to stress this point. Whether a given arbitrary x belongs to the set of things that satisfies p or doesn't belong to p. If p isn't trivial, then p is undecidable. There are lots of theorems we proved to know how uh, how deep 
the difficulties caused by this the mathematics region. You, you can show that there are interesting problems, trivial problems also, but very interesting problems in at any level of the arithmetical hierarchy. This is a technical concept in computer science and in logic, but it gives you an idea. It's an arithmetic, it's a hierarchy of difficulties of problems. You can even formulate explicitly a question which leads to a sentence which cannot be made equivalent to anything <coughs> arithmetical and even beyond. Even beyond. Then you will start juggling with tools like forcing and the like to the to extend the difficulty of your problems. But I believe that the main idea, the main issue has already been reached. That, that is, you have lots of problems which are eventually equivalent to problems in mathematics, in the, the usual, usual fare that a math mathematician goes through, and which are as difficult as you wish to concoct. And this is an exercise. Contextuality is undecidable. Entanglement is undecidable. There is a different proof for the undecidability of entanglement. Do you know the Russian, the Russian mathematician, I think. But I leave it as an exercise. <laughs> no, it's simple. <laughs> and the main reference, this is the, your sponsor, I said, is this book which I wrote with Greg Chaitin and Acosta uh, about two or three years ago, and which was discussed with Greg over a beer in a bar in New York. At least we have, if we have to work, let's make it enjoyable. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I will tell her. She will be. So, time for question. Yes? Well, I just want to ask about the halting function that you described. Could that be a physical realization? Uh, yes, I think it would. Actually, not a full realization because <coughs> you, you have to deal with something that goes over the real line and then, yeah. then you have to compactify the real line. Mm -hmm. So, there is going to be some collapse. Uh, but there are tricks. Uh, I'm a, uh, my BS is in engineering. You can't engineer even if my uh, I, uh, I was trained as a physicist and I'm a natural physicist. I still get, uh, get something of the empirical ideas required for these things. Let me put it plainly. Nobody <coughs> wants to risk trying to build this horrible, which is something very simple, technically, from the engineering viewpoint. Because you have the expression. It's like building a, a, an analog computer out of a given differential equation. We settled another set of problems, which was very, uh, which was very <coughs> In 1974, the American Mathematical Society uh, organized a symposium to discuss the state of the art, the discussion of the Hilbert problem, and asked them, those who were at the symposium, to give a listing of new problems. And Arnold, Virginia Arnold, gave some very interesting problems, which were decision problems. Uh, about dynamical systems, you know, the equilibrium state, if it's stable or unstable. And we showed that there would be no algorithms. I would like to make a remark about the situation in computer science. Because we live in a funny world. Mathematician creates some illusions and then make everybody to believe in it. What does it mean? Turing machine were good to uh, represent 
to model computers only of computers at the beginning of computer era. Modern computers work in a very different mode. And uh, they can do things that Turing machine cannot. And if you take, for example, the Hawking Turing, uh, the Hawking problem for Turing machine, it easily solved by inductive Turing machine. So the situation now is essentially different than it was at the time, not only of Turing, but of Church, and Kliny, and others, forefathers of computer science. Well, my own view is that, I, as, as I said, I don't believe Turing machines are the limit. Someone more able with practical stuff than I will follow one of the possibilities and eventually build some kind of hypercomputer. I believe this will happen, not uh, when the uh, say, uh, there is some kind of scientific advance <coughs> to make one such machine. But when people really decide to ignore this kind of prejudice and try to, uh, uh, to build this thing, so far nobody has done that. There are two blocks, probably some difficulty which are not. Uh, I, I don't really know which is in the practical side of the construction and prejudice because that would be against some, some uh, unsci unscientific. That's the impression I have. As I said, I, I'm agnostic about this kind of thing. Uh. I just wondered whether there was any way to clarify in what sense in your exercise we are supposed to prove that contextuality is undecidable. In any sense. Because it's a kind of wise like theorem. So I, I was thinking about that when you were showing me. You have to have a kind of formal setting which includes enough arithmetic and, uh, and uh, other details. As you present, I doubt there would be any undecidability. But if you, you say, I believe this is one of those S, and you give a very complicated expression, there will be a situation where you cannot prove that this is yes or R or whatever. Uh, I have to say the, the same question. Oh, so it's the same question. Almost okay. the same. If it's the same. The, my question is most than any simple words. Isn't it undecidability depend upon of the context? Or you think it's absolute truth? You <laughs> beat me. No, let me think about it, but I don't. No, 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 let me ponder. Okay. okay, may I give the answer to this question? Yes. No, 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 trust me. The answer. Yes. Uh, it is, you are true. This is true. So that it depends on the context. Do you think that the, the possibility of quantum computers, at least in a theoretical... They don't go beyond the Turing model. Mm -hmm. So far, every... Every part of the <coughs> that has been introduced, ideally, doesn't go beyond the Turing model. Yeah, but, but my question has to do with the, the fact that quantum computers somehow, uh, when you prove something, you are using essentially uh, quantum channels, right? Quantum operators. So can this introduce a modification of probability theory in the sense of demonstration of mathematics, in the notion of what is to prove something? That, that was my question. I know that they are equivalent. Yes, uh, well, there is a point which you know I know much better than I do, which is uh, the kind of probability which you have in quantum mechanics is the standard overall probability. It's different from several properties. Additivity doesn't work. 
The Penrose approach takes uh, uh, quantum computing beyond Turing with his non-computability, and he uses Gödel's theorem for that argument. Okay. It's okay. But for me, it's a surprise because everything that I have seen or discussed about quantum computing, sorry, uh, starts with a caveat. These things do not go beyond the, uh, the Turing model. But I'm going to take a look uh, at it. I can give you a reference. Oh, please. Oh, okay. okay, last question, Peter. Yeah, um, when, when, when I was studying formal language theory as a computer scientist, I vaguely remember there was this proof, I, maybe it was from Cole McGrath, that we, we know that they proved the existence of languages outside of Turing computability, but the proof wasn't constructive. So do you have a sense of what these languages would look like? Like you have the context sensitive languages, what what what, what would they really I have no idea. And that is it. the point is I was interested in proving these uh, noble theorems about chaos and about stability of dynamical systems. And then in internet application on a, on economics, people in economics, in economics, in economics are very interested in this kind of thing. And I couldn't go back to my initial point we have to do with computer science. So I cannot give you the uh, presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So the next talk is by Rushan and Kitiba Jafarov. One of the passive contextuality in scientific systems of high wax. Okay, thank you. And I am going to discuss an